the basic idea of free software is that's the way you can have freedom inside your own computer. Because it's free as in freedom. We, it's frei, not kostenlos. Always has been. Although it took me a few years to realize that this distinction was central and that I should focus on it explicitly. So, free software means that the user has the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program operates and does your computing the way you wish. With these two freedoms, each user has individual control over what she does with that program. But individual control is not enough. Most users are not programmers. We also need collective control. So we need two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute exact copies, and freedom three is the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions. You add these two freedoms, and now any group of users can work together to exercise control over what the program does for them, and the group can offer copies to other people as well. So, with free software, the users control the program. If the program is not free, that means the program controls the users, which is an injustice, because there's always somebody that controls the program. We typically call it the owner. It might be the developer, who knows. The point is, the owner controls the program, and the program controls the users, which means this program is an instrument giving the owner unjust power over the users. This is why non-free software should not exist. So the aim of the free software movement is no more non-free software. We want to liberate everyone in cyberspace. Now, if, you ha if people are using... But... If somebody is using free software, and if somebody is using only free software, that doesn't mean he is stopped from doing anything wrong. No, it means that he has control over what his computer does. So, for instance, if a doctor's office uses free software, it means that it's not being controlled by some company. That doesn't mean the doctor can't use the software to lie. Uh, he, he shouldn't. Uh, if it would be a crime to defraud people, I hope he gets prosecuted. This is one of the things that makes it so important to have a state that's just. But we can't expect free software to stop people from doing wrong with their own computers. Because the point of free software is to stop them from being subjugated by somebody else inside their own computers. So. Free software eliminates one of the injustices in life, but it doesn't mean that nobody can do anything wrong. Free software means we can exercise control of our software. It doesn't guarantee that there are no bugs or no malicious features in the software. It means we're in a position to take the effort to get rid of them. At least we're not helpless. The users of a non-free program are totally defenseless. If Microsoft wants to put something evil into Windows, if Apple wants to put something evil into the iThings, the users are helpless. They're defenseless. Now, when Canonical puts spyware into Ubuntu, at least the users are not helpless and defenseless. They can make a modified version of that software, which doesn't spy on them, and I'm sure they have. The point is, Free software doesn't magically make all software be okay, but it means that since we are in control, we can make it okay, or at least we have the, we're in a position to try, which is much better than not being in a position to even try. So we've got to insist on free software, but that doesn't magically guarantee there's nothing bad in the world. Meanwhile, that concerns what happens inside your computer. But we also use the internet, and there are good and bad ways to use the internet. There are dangerous things that can happen to you if you use the internet, like 
uh, various services might demand that you hand over personal information, which for the most part you just shouldn't do. Uh, <clears throat> but on the nowadays there are lots of ways you could buy things over the internet, and they basically all require you to identify yourself, so I don't do them. I'm just not going to fall into uh, surrendering to surveillance in that way. So I buy things in stores and I pay cash. Uh, anyway, it would be really good if we could buy things over the internet and not identify ourselves. Well, there are two kinds of things you could buy. You could buy access to some information or you could buy a physical thing. Buying access to information is easier because all you need for that is an anonymous way to pay for it. Nowadays, often they don't even ask people to pay for it. They track people instead so that they can uh, get paid for advertising. And the more they track people, the more they get paid for the advertising. And the whole thing is disgusting. Now, I don't really care if I see an ad, but I will not, let, I will not let them track me. So today what that means is I better not let any ads appear on my computer, whether I look at them or not. Uh, but if, they could, if we could pay them instead and pay them in an anonymous way, then sites could make money for whatever it is they publish and they wouldn't have to mistreat us. So this is something very important for a free, for a freedom respecting internet. Uh, another bad thing that that sites, that services can do that most people don't even think about still is service as a software substitute. <laughs> the evil thing about, or in other words, SaaS, although of course SaaS to other people means software as a service, and that's what I used to call it, and then I realized people didn't understand what that meant, so I found a better expansion for the abbreviation, service as a software substitute. It's doing something in somebody else's server, which you should be doing by running a program in your own computer. Now, when can you do a job by running a program in your own computer? When it's operating on your data, or data that you've got in your computer, and it doesn't involve talking to anybody else, so if you had the right program, you could just run it, and it would give you the answer that you want. So that's computing that's yours. It's yours personally. It, it's something that you can and therefore should have total control over. There are other things we do in computing which are joint activities, like if I want to talk with you. Well, that's not something I could do by myself. You're going to be involved. That's a joint activity. It's not just mine. And therefore, there's no reason why I should expect to have total control over it. You could just as well be the one who should have total control over it, right? Uh, so when an activity involves multiple people, you can demand to have full control over it, not in general. But when it's only yours, when no one else is involved, then you should have total control over it. But if you entrust the computing to the software in somebody else's server, then you have no control over it. Then she has total control over your computing. And that's the injustice of SAS. Of course, there's also the issue of whatever data about you other computers on the net uh, end up with, whether because they're doing surveillance on you or because you, they demand you give them the information and you want the service so badly you tell them a bunch of things about you, like your name, your address, uh, well, now you're feeding the surveillance. <clears throat> to the extent that we can do things peer-to-peer, -peer, that's good. That's the best way to do things, so that there's no server where anyone is collecting a lot of data. But when we can't do something peer-to-peer, -peer, 
at least we should minimize the amount of information the server ever gets. I used to be able to use Google Maps until about two or three years ago and then it broke. And the reason it broke is I won't run the non-free JavaScript code that it sends. I, I, I just deactivate JavaScript all the time unless I can actually see the code and decide that it's free or that it's trivial. But uh, it used to be that Google Maps would work with JavaScript deactivated and then it stopped working with JavaScript deactivated. Everything would appear except the map itself, which wasn't too useful. But anyway, when it worked, I would never type in an address. I wouldn't tell it which place I was interested in. I'd just say, such and such city. And then I would scroll around and I would look. I would see the place I was looking for, but Google wouldn't know what place I was looking for. Now you could imagine a local client program, which should be free software of course, that would do this job. It would, down, it would pull in the map data for the region you're interested in, and it would locally find the address you want, and it would show you on the screen where that is, but it would never tell any map server what address it was. <clears throat> That's an example of designing to give away the least possible personal information while getting the job done. And of course, if it also did caching, then it would then the, the server wouldn't even know all the times that you get interested in a particular city. The point is, it wasn't designed to minimize that. Infor that information, just the opposite. Google designed it to make it attractive and appealing to put in as much information as possible so Google would get as much information as possible. But when we redesign the internet, we need to think about this. We need to design uh, the various useful programs that involve getting data from the internet so as to not reveal information about what it is you want to do. Now, I talked about uh, selling access to data, but selling physical goods is a useful thing too. And once we have an anonymous payment system, it wouldn't really be very hard to sell physical goods too. Now, they couldn't ship the goods to your address. If you tell them your address, You've told them effectively who you are, but it doesn't have to go to your address. There are lots of local stores that sell lots of things, and they have some space to hold things. Well, why don't they say, you want to buy something on the Internet? Come here. We'll give us cash. We'll order it. Here's a receipt. When it's here, come in and get it. Oh. Now, in fact, they're starting to do this for Amazon in some countries. For instance, in England, Amazon ships to one of these stores and the store will hold it for you. But you should never buy anything from Amazon. Look at stolman.org slash amazon.html. Amazon mistreats independent bookstores, authors, publishers, its workers, the treasury, and readers. So the point is, if stores can do this for Amazon, they could do this for anyone selling on the internet. It's a problem of engineering society. You could almost call it social engineering, except that means something else. Here I'm not talking about tricking anybody, I'm talking about engineering the way business is set up and functions. But it could certainly be done. So there are many issues of freedom affecting digital technology. Some of them apply to systems that we don't have anything to do with. In the UK, they've put so many cameras by the side of the road that they track all car travel. And they can track any car in real time, and they build up a dossier of the movements of every car, and they could be keeping that for 10 or 50 years. Well. We can't stop that by changing the way our computers work. We can't stop that by changing how the internet works. 
We can only stop that by political organizing <clears throat> or by destroying all the cameras. But uh, if the police are active, that might not be able to get started. So uh, we need to organize to defend our freedom. Now, there are many things we need the state to do. We need the state to provide food for those who are hungry, provide medical care for everyone, and above all, tax the rich to pay for it. <clears throat> so when I propose an anonymous payment system, I want it to be anonymous for whoever's paying, but not for whoever's receiving the money. The web shop doesn't need to be able to hide how much money it pulls in. It's the customers who should be anonymous. We want the web shop to pay its taxes. In fact, one of the big uh, legal issues of our time is how to stop, how to change the system of tax laws that has been set up to make it easy for companies and the rich to uh, shift the profits around so that they don't pay any taxes. And I've proposed a system of taxation that would correct this problem. Uh, I believe there's a link to it on stallman.org somewhere, but in any case, the idea is you do, uh, you tax companies' gross revenue, not their profits, and you do it with a tax rate that increases as the size of the company goes up. And you compute the size of the company considering all its foreign affiliates as well. And all the companies that are really part of one structure, you just treat it as one in order to compute the size of the company which determines the tax rate. And the bigger the company is, the higher the tax rate it pays, which will give small companies an advantage over big companies which is very desirable. We want to make the big companies split up so that, they're, so that they can't be too big to jail, as is happening. The, the U.S. government admits it has declined to prosecute some criminal companies because they were too big to jail. So we need a democratic state. Democracy is a system whereby the many who are not rich join together so that together they're stronger than the rich. Now, many countries have the forms that we consider democratic, but most of them are not democratic in substance. They're working for the, the rich, which means they're plutocracies. So, of course, they're unjust, and they lead to massive poverty and massive unemployment. But if we didn't have a state, there would be very little to hold back the rich. So what we need is a state that's democratic, a state that works for the non-rich and actually enables us to limit the power of the rich to do to us whatever they wish. So <clears throat> I've campaigned for 30 years now, which is not qu almost 30 years. So it's not quite as long, I believe, as Jacob has been alive, but it's a long time uh, for free software. I do not campaign for open anything. That term is a mistake. It leads thought in the wrong direction. Because open is a weak word. It sounds nice, but it doesn't it doesn't raise the issue of your freedom. So, in terms of rhetoric, it's a way people can make a cause that sounds nice and avoids the important issue. And in the discussions in our field, you'll find some people talk about free software and freedom, others prefer the word open, usually because they don't want to talk about freedom. And others who do care about freedom say open because they feel they have to let they have to go along with the current 
although this debilitates them as supporters of freedom because they're not making that point in a clear way. So, if you think that freedom is a central issue here, please say free, frei, libre, some word that, re that refers to freedom. And the less you say open, the better. I once uh, signed a statement in favor of, quote, open access, unquote, in scientific publication. Because in substance, the definition was right. It included the a demand to let people republish, redistribute the papers, and do other useful things with them. So I thought, well, the substance is right, even though the term focuses on a secondary point, namely the whether the original publication site will let anybody download the article. Uh, still, because the substance was right, I supported it. And what I saw happen after that was the meaning drifted to align with the words that they were using. They forgot about the more powerful requirement that people have to be free to redistribute. And they, laws were being passed in favor of, quote, open access, unquote, which only said that the publication site has to allow access by everyone. And then I realized I can't support, quote, open access, unquote, anymore because it no longer stands for the right meaning. So I support uh, <clears throat> freedom respecting scientific publishing. We've got to, in addition to campaigning for the specific things that defend our freedom in specific issues, we have to say free and freedom as often as possible. We have to formulate the specific issues explicitly in terms of how they relate to freedom so that we direct society's thinking towards a focus on freedom. something from the FSF, please come and see me, and if you have some money to give to the cause, you could join the Free Software Foundation, or Free Software Foundation Europe, or both. And there are some FSF and Gideon stickers over there.